This revision video is for Year 12 students in English Literature at Excel and it's on Himalayan Balsam by Anne Stevenson. So Anne was born in Cambridge in 1933. She spent time in America and England as a child. She studied music at University in Michigan and thought she would become a professional musician. When she began losing her hearing, she turned to poetry instead. This poem concerns itself with the olfactory sense as a prompt for memory and the poem makes use of senses to explore life and nature's key themes of love and death and the relationship between them. The plant in the title, Himalayan balsam, mainly grows along riverbanks and ditches, and it flowers from October to June. It was originally from Western Himalaya, but it now grows rapidly in Britain and outcompetes other vegetations that often colonise with areas quite quickly. Uh, Stevenson states the home is more romantic than I usually allow myself to be. It's aimless and meandering, and it's got unclear transitions, off-topic digressions and run-on sentences, it follows ideas and images wherever they lead, almost acting as a stream of consciousness, uh, with ideas in parentheses. Um, for, for example, they act as asides, afterthoughts and digressions. Appearances can be deceptive. The visual structure um, is divided into four line stanzas, but it seems presentational rather than with any real meaning. Death is a condition of life, and nature kills in order to re recreate some are repeated and ended courtships and murders. And it's that data theory of Keats's negative capability, which is capable of being in an uncertain condition, so mysteries and doubts, and accepting them without any irritable reaching after facts and reason. So poem states that Himalayan poet sorry states that Himalayan balsam should be read as an up to date ode to melancholy. So the idea that it's okay not to understand everything, particularly with grand themes like love and death. Orchid-lipped, loose-jointed, purplish, indolent flowers with a ripe smell of peaches, like a girl's breath through lipstick, delicate and coarse in the weed lap of late summer rivers, dishevelled, weak-stemmed, common as brambles, as love which subtracts us from seasons, their courtships and murders, metasegmentata in her web, and the male waiting, between blossom and violent blossom, meticulous spiders repeated in gossamer, and the slim males waiting. So orchid-lipped and loose-jointed suggests an attractiveness and sensuality. Smell evokes memory um, and the simile with a ripe smell of peaches or like a girl's breath through lipstick. It's the end of the season with the late summer as it's dry, it's lazy. And the juxtaposition between delicate and coarse and then dishevelled and weak stemmed. Um, it's all kind of momentary, transient and it's all to do with the senses, particularly smell, which is very strong in this poem. Common as brambles is similarly suggesting um, that the brambles are inferior and everywhere. You've got the enjambement, um, and as, as I said in the previous slide, the four line stanzas seem rather arbitrary rather than for any particular meaning. You've got the cycle of life and season through courtships and murders. So this is again about the cyclical nature of life and the seasons. The metasegmentata is a type of spider that mates with this female when she's caught her prey and is wrapping it to avoid being eaten. So they sort of lurk around the edges of the female's webs and then while the female is distracted, that's when they mate with them. But you've got this juxtaposition of meticulous um, and gossamer, which is a very fine silken thread of the web, with the violence of the um, mating and the danger of the mating. The use of brackets suggesting the asides and afterthoughts and the ellipsis is quite foreboding. There's a sense of tension there um, and a sense of um, fragrance too rich for keeping too light to remember, like grief for the cat's sparrow and the wild girl's beech-hatched embryo. She ran from the reaching water with the broken egg in her hand, but the clamped bill refused brandy and grubs. A shred too naked and perilous for life offered freely in cardboard boxes Little windowsill coffins for bird death, kitten death, squirrel death. Some are repeated and ended in heartbreak, in sad, small funerals. So it's heavy, laden with memory, this fragrance, um, but it's too light to remember. It's ephemeral, transient, and there's a contrast between the idea that its memory can be quite strong, but you can't quite grasp the memory of it. We've got natural deaths, so the sparrow being eaten by the cat, and the girl, um, girl's egg at hatching too soon and um, you've got the fertility and cycle of nature and the idea of the broken egg. You've then got the image of a child trying to save the baby bird, trying to feed it 
and you've got the childish innocence and it's exposed to death and the experience and the fact that the summer ends in heartbreak. The first time we experience death, um, we're not sure how to deal with the grief. So they're making little cardboard boxes trying to find a purpose for that grief. The naked and perilous suggesting the vulnerability of these. Sometimes, shaping bread or scraping potatoes for supper, I have stood in the kitchen transfixed by what I'd call love, if love were a whiff, a wanting for no particular lover, no child or baby or creature. Love, dear love, I could cry to these sense-filling ragged flowers and mean nothing but no by that word's breadth, to their evident going, their important descent through red, towering stalks to the riverbed. It's not, as I thought, that death, I mean, obviously there's an enjambment to carry on in the next stanza. So the sibilance in the first line is creating a soothing domestic image. And you've got a passing emotion with a whiff. What I'd call love suggests is personal interpretation that we all think of love in different ways. And you've got the collapse of the blossom that symbolises the ageing and passing of time. And the important descent. This is something that has to happen. It's an accepted part of the life cycle. And the Himalayan balsam that it's referencing in particular does collapse down on itself um, and then rots into the riverbed. It's not as I thought that death creates love, more that love knows death. Therefore tears, therefore poems, therefore long stone sobs of cathedrals that speak to no ferret or fox that prevent no massacre. I am combing abundant leaves from these icy shallows. So you've got philosophical musings that starting to take on more of a um, purposeful feel. We've got the human response to death, but there's no purpose for the grief. It's not going to change anything. And you've got the physical image of flowers in water, which obviously are already cut down and dead. But you've also got the metaphorical combing of the thoughts. Love, it was you who said, murder the killer we have to call life, and we'd be a bare planet under a dead sun. Then I loved you with the usual soft lust of October that says yes to the coming winter and a summoning odour of balsa. So when she is referring to love, it's not clear here whether she's addressing the lover or whether she's actually addressing the abstract concept of love itself. And you've got decay necessary for the plant to live, for all life to live in fact, and the strength of the scent and of the senses and the imagery that's used in this poem continues right to the end where you get the odour in the last line. 